As you've seen, uh, today's a little bit different. Um, we've had a little bit different day. But I wanted to have a day when we get to worship all together with all of our families and just all worship together. Uh, Miss Deb and her team, each and every week, they go upstairs and they have a great worship time. They have a wonderful time. We're doing everything we can upstairs to make sure that we are equipping our children with God's Word, giving them the tools that they need in a, in a lost and, and just a rough world. But today, I hope that as after at the end of the day, when we get done with our, the, what's going on here, I hope that we can take it home and we can talk about this message even in our homes. So today we're going to explore the ministry of Paul. And we're going to be talking about Paul and how he was willing to share the truth about Jesus Christ, even though he was in a new place and the gods were kind of against him. When Paul was in the city of Athens, he was confronted with the sin of idolatry. In Athens, Paul saw all these different um, gods, he saw all these different idols. And idols were, idolatry was a big part of the culture there in Athens. It was widely accepted. No one spoke out against it because they just didn't know any different. Remember, those who were in Athens, they were Gentiles. So they weren't brought up in the Jewish traditions. They didn't know the Old Testament laws. They didn't know about the Ten Commandments. And so Paul had to approach them a little bit differently than he would the Jewish people. But this should sound kind of vaguely familiar to us today, because if you think about it, our world today, here in 2020, idolatry is widely accepted in our world. We may not have idols or images in our houses, well we may, I hope we don't, but we still have parts of our life that we're, they have a special place of honor in our minds and in our hearts. Even though we know that God the Father told us we shall have no other gods before Him, we do. The result has, has been that many people, they have a love of God, yet they are unwilling to remove any other idols that they have in their life. Now when Paul enters into Athens, he would have seen a building that we know called the, the Parthenon. You probably know what the Parthenon looks like. You probably read about it. You talked about it. You probably heard that the Parthenon was um, dedicated to the goddess Athena. Inside this structure, um, historians believe, what could have been up to 12 different Greek gods and goddesses. But outside the Parthenon and throughout the whole city, there were statues and there were idols for gods and any god you could even think of. It was said that in Athens, you could find a god easier than you could find a man. That's how many gods they had in Athens. So when, when Paul enters Athens, he quickly notices that there is this great number of idols, and, and this is kind of normal for this city. And look at what is recorded in Acts 17, verse 16. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. Athens was a city that was the center of culture, education, and fine arts. Those who lived there were probably very proud of the city and all of its customs. My help was come up. But she's going to be here a while. <laughs> we all know that human achievements and desires can distract us. The things that we do, the things that we get propped up for doing, they can easily uh, start to become a priority in our life. But Paul did not care about worldly things. He didn't care about positions, titles, he just didn't care about it. Paul did not seek to satisfy the worldly appetites. Paul's only agenda was Jesus Christ. It's his only agenda. So every day that Paul was there in Athens, he would go into the synagogue and go into the marketplace and he would evangelize. He would talk about Jesus to anyone who would listen. Now, the marketplace isn't like going to the supermarket that we think of. The marketplace was the cultural center. It's where everybody would come in and they would meet. They would discuss new ideas and talk about enlightenment and ways to please their many gods. 
So while Paul was in this marketplace, he began speaking uh, to the Epicurean and the Stoic philosophers. These followers of Epicurus and Zeno, they began to debate with Paul. And here's what we read in Acts 17. It says a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Now, out of that passage, I, I can't get around it. There's a weird word in there. You know what it is. Babbler. Did you see it? The word babbler is right there in this passage. Now, here's where we get the idea, or here's what we can take from the idea of babbler. Anybody ever feed ducks? Anybody you ever feed duck? I remember feeding ducks when I was younger. And what would you feed them? Bread. Yeah, I know they say you're not supposed to feed ducks bread now, you know, but that's a whole other topic. But you would feed them bread. You take the bread and you throw it out, right? Yeah, you want to make sure that everybody got some bread. You know, they, 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 the ducks would go and they'd look around and, uh, you know, here's some duck, you know, here's some duck food. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, here's some duck food for you. Yeah, yeah. And you would feed the ducks. But did you ever notice? <laughs>
inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of the land. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Though he is not far from any one of us, for he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and we move and we have our being. As some of your old poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone and any image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but he, now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. 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 You may be seated. So just a moment ago, I, I quickly went across and passed our very first step to help us get rid of those unknown gods in our life. And to help us get rid of any idolatry that we may have. So our first step is this. Face the truth that you may have idolatry in your life. It's okay to have interests and hobbies in this wondrous world that God has made for us. But we cannot allow anything to have a higher priority or to consume us uh, and consume more of our time, our talents, and our treasures than God's heart. If we're going to overcome and remove any idols in our lives, we must first identify its existence, and we have to be honest and recognize that we may have idolatry in our lives. And idolatry can take many, many different forms. So I've asked Miss Deb to come up, and she's going to help me with this part of our message. So kids, make sure you're watching Miss Deb up here. Um, she's going to help us identify just a few objects they could be idols in our lives if we're not careful. So we're going to go to our first guy. What do we have in our very first guy? What do we got? Books. So we have we have a dictionary. We have a thesaurus, and we have a Bible. So books. Okay. Well, in Athens, they had the goddess Athena. And Athena was the goddess of wisdom. And wisdom is good to have. I, I think we can agree with that. Um, as followers of Christ, we have God's word, and all the answers that we could ever want from life are contained within God's word. Amen? Amen. I hope we believe that. Um, some people, now, some people, they do get a little distracted, even from God's word. Some people know God's word, and, and they, they, they think they know what it says, but it never gets from their mind into their heart. So as followers of Jesus, we should always be open to hearing the wisdom that comes from God's word. But it's not about knowledge. It's not about religion. It's about a relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. Remember, Paul said to the people in Athens, he said this, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. Did you hear that? I see that in every way you are very religious. Now, is this a compliment or is this a criticism? I think it's both. I can see both. For those who are spiritual, praise God. Continue to grow. Continue to, to take in this word and, and write it on your heart. But for those who are lost, superstitious, or even stuck in what you think you know, Wisdom can be an idol, and you can begin to have this knowledge, and you can believe you have this wisdom, but it can shut you off to any truth that God is trying to speak to you. But this leads us to our second point of how we can rid our lives of those unknown gods that will destroy our life. Again, we have to get rid of this idolatry that is killing us. But secondly, we must expose our wrong beliefs. Let's be honest. Most people are unwilling to admit when they're wrong. But in our spiritual life, it has even bigger consequences. This is why last week we talked about the words of Paul, and he, he tells us that we should examine ourselves. 
We are to examine ourselves and make sure that we are in the faith. If we never face our hidden sins, if we never face our idols, we'll never get rid of them. So we must pray to God. We must pray to open up our hearts and our minds and, and pray that God will reveal those wrong beliefs to us. So our first God was wisdom. That was a theme. And wisdom is something that we need, but it must be within the confines of God, God's word. So what's another, uh, another God that we may have? sell everything you have and give it to the poor. In the church, we just talk about a tithe. Ten percent. But money can absolutely reveal an idol in our lives. God has given us clear instruction and wisdom in how to handle our money. But if money is a God to us, we will handle our finances in the way that we see fit, and we will tell God that we know better than him. I once heard a pastor say, if you want to know the heart of a person, check their checkbook. Look at their checkbook. You look at where their money goes, and you're going to find their heart. The rich young ruler, he couldn't get past that point. Couldn't get past those worldly riches. And we know from what Jesus' words, word tells us, it cost him his eternal life. So we have wisdom, we have money, we have prosperity. What's our, what's our third one? Oh, trophy. Very good. Everybody likes a trophy, right? Everybody likes to win. It's good. Well, in Greek, you have the goddess Nike. We know the t-shirts and we know the tennis shoes. Right? Thank you. If you want to be stronger, if you want to be faster, you would worship this goddess. And yes, some people have um, competition and winning as an idol in their lives. Some people do not like to lose. It doesn't matter if it's a race or a game of checkers. It doesn't matter. They don't want to lose. Some people will place winning above any higher priority, even Jesus and his church. That may reveal an idol that we have in our life. Our life should not be about winning or being the best. But Paul does tell us in 1 Corinthians 9, 24, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run? But only one gets the prize. Run in such a way as to get the prize. I love this because Paul is talking about the heavenly prize and that everlasting life. Thank you, Mr. Dad. I appreciate your help up here. Join me. Thank you. Thank you. That was from Daniel White. <laughs> but, you know, think about it. You know, we just went through a few examples and in Athens. They have many, many, many gods. 
Again, in Athens, you could find a God for anything you wanted. One goddess that I wanted to bring up, I, I never heard of this, maybe you have, is the goddess Colossina. Colossina. Um, if, Colossina was the goddess of the sewer system. I'll leave it alone. Now, Colossina was a Roman goddess, but I couldn't help myself. I had to go with But in Athens, there were many, many, many gods, and they worshipped many, many, many gods. Now, when I say gods, these gods, these things up here, I'm talking about little g-gods. I'm not talking about God. I'm not talking about the great I am. I'm not talking about the Father Almighty. But when Paul encounters this great number of gods in Athens and this culture, notice Paul is not intimidated by these gods. Paul is also, he's not drawn to these gods. But instead, Paul stands up. He uses them as a way to find common ground between his God, our God, and the gods that they were worshiping. And it, this common ground allowed him to introduce the people in Athens to the one true God, the resurrected Savior, and we know him as Jesus. And Paul warned the people, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now, now he commands people everywhere to repent. As followers of Christ, we should take time to examine our heart, make sure we are following God's word each and every day. We cannot add our own thoughts, our own opinions to God's word, but we have to make sure that when we read God's word, it pours into our hearts. And a part of this examination of reading God's word is facing the truth that we may have idols in our life. We may have idols that are blinding us to his truth in our life. If we do not do what is required and spelled out by God's, God's word, then what we're doing is we're following God on our own terms. And when we follow God on our own terms, what we have is a form of Christianity, which in reality is no Christianity. If we are following Christ on our terms, it's a form of Christianity that we have molded in the way that we see fit, the way that's okay with us, but it's completely useless. All the gods in Athens were completely useless. A couple of weeks ago, I talked about the passage when Jesus was speaking to the, to the Pharisees. And the Pharisees believed that they knew everything that they needed to know, and they were the best. But this wisdom that the Pharisees had was about their God and, and, and about God, but unfortunately, what they knew blinded them to Jesus, the Messiah, when he was right there with them. The danger is that we can easily convince ourselves that we can follow Christ under our own terms, and then we use the Bible as just kind of an outline. Well, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to just ask God to make sure he blesses it, and yeah, it was good. That's good. We pick and choose what we want God's word to say, and we find a form of Christianity that fits our life. It fits our schedule. It fits what we want out of life. But that form of Christianity is useless. Jesus says, if you love me, you will follow my commands. The idols we're holding on to in our life, they prevent us from living a life that is holy and pleasing to God. And in reality, we're giving more glory to our idols than we are to God the Father. The bottom line is this. Is your relationship with Christ based on your comfort level and what you can get from Jesus and his church and his people? Or is your relationship built on a real relationship with the foundation being God's word and his commands? Because see, the difference between
between those two positions is literally a difference between life and death. Not physically, but spiritually. There's a huge difference between these two positions. The idols that we hold on to in our lives, they have to continually be fed. They have to be satisfied. And hear me, we can have false idols and even be in the church. But these false, these false idols that we place our trust in, they cannot help us when we fall. But praise God, once we make the decision to follow Jesus Christ, never will they leave us and never will they forsake us. Proverbs 24, 16 tells us, for though the righteous fall seven times, they rise again. But the wicked stumble when calamity strikes. We may make some choices that make us fall, but God is always there. He has given us the comforter, the Holy Spirit, and he wants to help us each and every day. And this is the message of Jesus Christ that we should be sharing in our world. So here's our final point for today. Share the good news. Pretty simple. Share the good news of our resurrected Christ. That's what Paul did in Athens. He shared the good news about our resurrected Christ. Paul shared the good news of Jesus on Mars Hill because he wanted the people to turn from these false gods. In Acts 17, verses 32 and 34, we read this. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. But others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. With that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them were Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, and also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. So some will sneer. Some will be sure to hear a little bit more. Some may even fall. But regardless of how the message is received, our relationship with Christ should be so strong that regardless of the outcome, it cannot stop us from witnessing the truth about who Jesus Christ is, our resurrected Lord. Amen. This should be our priority. And we saw it. Look at the first part of Acts 17, 16. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, and I'm going to stop this right here. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens. See, Paul was in Athens and he was waiting for Silas. He was waiting for Timothy to show up. We read this in one verse earlier, which says, Those who escorted Paul brought him to Athens and then left with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. So Paul is in Athens, waiting for Timothy, waiting for Silas to show up. He could have done anything he wanted. He could have spent every day hanging out by the pool. He could have gone fishing. He could have taken a vacation. But Paul's relationship with Christ was so strong that he took every opportunity to witness to those in Athens about who Jesus Christ is. And, they, and he told them, Jesus Christ is the resurrected Lord, and nothing is going to stop Paul from sharing this truth. This is how our relationship should be with him. Our relationship with Christ cannot have barriers that cause us to stop. These barriers may be a job, it may be a family member, it may be the material gods that we have in this world. And these things that consume our minds and consume our time. These things can become barriers in our relationship with Jesus Christ. Those, those barriers must be identified and dealt with. See, our takeaway today is simply this. Eliminate the idols in your life. Eliminate anything that is standing between you and God the Father, because God said, you shall have no other gods before me. That's the word of the Lord. 
as our praise team comes back to the front. A question. A question that I kept thinking about all week. Let me ask you. Does it grieve you? Does it grieve you when you see people giving more glory to idols than to God the Father? And if so, have you taken time to examine your own life to see if there are idols that maybe are robbing you of the joy that God has for you? Praise God, He's always there. Amen? Amen. Praise God, He's always there. He's waiting for us to get our priorities straight. He's still waiting on me. Maybe. Please wake up. Would you please wake up and see what I'm trying to do in your life? But like we talked about last week, Jesus is the one who can give us power over our hurts, our habits, and our hang-ups. Amen, CR people? Amen. Because God has great plans for his people. God has great plans. Jeremiah even tells us that God has great plans for you. Plans to help you. Plans to prosper you. To give you hope and a future. That's the word of the Lord also. He gave us this promise. That's what our God wants from us. And that's the God that I want to know. So face the fact that you may, we all may, have idols in our life. And we have to identify them. And we have to get rid of them. We have to eliminate them because they could be, and very well may be, a barrier that is preventing you from a true relationship with God. There we have now, there we have closed.